That video is probably the best expression of what happens in a pastor's heart on Easter morning. Did you know, for people like me, this is like the Super Bowl. This is like Christmas, and this is my birthday, and this is everything wrapped into one. It doesn't get much better than a pastor standing in front of people on Easter morning. But I found out this past week that not everyone feels the same way about Easter as I do. Uh, I was playing soccer on Wednesday, and uh, I was trying to invite one of my teammates to come to the service. And I said, hey, you should, you should really come on Sunday to Easter. And he looked back at me and he scowled and he said, give me one good reason why. And I know I should have had like a really good compelling answer, but I, <laughs> to be honest, I just kind of, I sputtered and I stuttered and I like, it's, uh, it's Easter? I don't know. <laughs> like, I know he, he didn't see a great reason to come to him. Easter Sunday was just another Sunday. And I was talking to my neighbor, and I was talking to him about Easter Sunday and Easter church and Easter worship, and he listened like he was really interested. And then as soon as I stopped talking, he looked back and he said, when is Easter Sunday? I said, on Sunday? Yeah, it's the same time every year. But apparently he wasn't counting down Easter with like the, the link chains of a kid who's looking forward to go to Disney quite like I was. You know, it dawned on me, pastors maybe feel a different way about Easter than lots of other people do. Uh, it might just be another Sunday. It might just be another holiday. Maybe kids get excited on Easter for their Easter baskets or the matriarchs of the family get excited to have Easter brunch after church where everyone can come. But, but maybe, I don't know, you're one of those people who's not quite as excited as some of us on Easter morning. So how about you? I mean, is this a day you've been counting down to? Is, is this a moment you just couldn't wait for? Did you wake up this morning and spring out of bed and send a group text to everyone that you knew like, ah, it's, it's Easter? Well, maybe not. Um, you know, maybe some of you, uh, if we're going to be really honest, are, are kind of s- skeptical of all this, you know, these songs, the, the things that Pastor Michael was reading. I, you don't want to be rude about it, but I don't know, you're not so sure about church or the Bible or the Christian religion. You know, people believe a lot of different things. There are a lot of different religions. We're raised in lots of different ways. Is this really more than just a story? Is this really true? Maybe you're a logical, reasonable, like science-based kind of person and you're thinking, really? You know, I don't want to knock anyone's beliefs, but is something like this actually, the, the National Population Bureau says that 109 billion people have lived on planet Earth in its history, and you probably don't know any of them that have come back from the dead. And so maybe you want to say, really? He's, he's risen from the dead? Is that actually true? And so you're not going to be rude about it, but, you know, in your heart, maybe you're not planning on coming back next Sunday. Maybe you're here because your girlfriend is really into church and you wanted to come, or you knew grandma would be kind of grouchy at Easter brunch if, if you didn't come with her. You know, maybe you had a, a teammate or a coworker, or a friend who's been bugging you and bugging you and bugging you and you said, fine, okay, I'll, I'll come and here you are. But this isn't like your, your life. This isn't your passion. This isn't your trust. This isn't your faith. This is just, this is just Sunday. Or maybe you're not, you're not a skeptic. Maybe that's not your problem with Easter. Maybe your problem is that you're a sinner. I don't mean like a, a regular sinner. You know, the Bible would say all of us have messed stuff up and, and made mistakes morally. I mean, you're one of those kind of people that just feels so bad about something that you've done that you just can't get that excited about much at all. I got an email uh, two weeks ago from a guy who, who sounds like he's really involved in church and he believes in Jesus, happily married with kids, and, and he can't bring himself to be happy about his faith because of something he did sexually when he was 18 years old. And he just feels like this, this shame and this embarrassment pressing down in his conscience and it, it comes back to him at random times and he just, he doesn't have this explosive joy like we saw in that video. But what sometimes happens to people, I was sitting in church actually on Thursday and this, this really embarrassing thought came to mind of something that I did 15 years ago. And, and it just like ruined my worship as I thought, how in the world could I, could I do that? And maybe bring a little bit of that baggage with you in the church today? Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it's a drinking problem. Uh, Maybe it's anger. Uh, Maybe it was an addiction. Maybe it's something that happened to you when you were little. Maybe it's something you did uh, when you were in college. Maybe it's just that one big thing that you can't get past or maybe it's a thousand little things that you just keep struggling with and, and you just wonder if God would really put up with you, if he would like you, if he would accept you after all that. And so you want to be excited about Easter but I don't know, there's something emotionally in the way. 
Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you're not a skeptic and maybe you're not a sinner. Maybe you just feel spiritually stuck. You you believe in this, that Jesus died for your sins and he rose from the dead. And there's nothing major on your conscience that you you can't get past. I don't know, maybe this is just another Easter like you come to every year. Maybe, in fact, you you come to church every single Sunday, but like the, the emotion and the passion and the excitement like, Jesus isn't the, the biggest thing going on in your life right now. The, the final four? I mean, you, you'll pick a bracket in a team you never heard of before, something you're screaming at the television set. I mean, that, that's emotional for you. But, like, prayer and church and this connection to God, like, I don't know, it just doesn't have the same passion. You feel stuck and you'd like to get there, but you're not. And so here's the question I want us to wrestle with this morning. If you have a program and a pen, I'd love for you to write this down. It's our first fill in the blank. The question is, is Easter for the skeptic? And it's Easter for the sinner. And it's Easter for the spiritually stuck. If you're not a pastor standing up to preach, if you're not a kid searching for an Easter basket, if you're not a mom about to throw the, the epic brunch with all the family around the table, is this really the best day of the year? And I think we find answers to all of those questions into the part of the Bible I want to share with you today. Now, there are four biographies of Jesus in the Bible. We call them the four Gospels. And there's a guy named Mark 2,000 years ago who, who wrote down a little bit of the Easter story. And I was reading just a few verses and I thought, man, this would be great for people who don't believe the story just yet. And then I kept reading and I noticed a few words and I thought, man, this would be really great for someone who can't get past some guilt or shame or sin. And then I kept reading and I thought, this would be really great for people who just haven't felt like emotionally charged up for Jesus in a long time. I think in, in just these few verses, If you're a skeptic or if you're a sinner, if you're stuck, you're going to find some great reasons to rejoice this morning. So before I unpack it for you, let me read the whole thing from Mark chapter 16. We start this morning with verse 1. You can find the words on the screen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified? He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Did you catch it? All right, let me help you. Let's start with the skeptic and let me point your attention just to one verse, verse 1. Did you notice those names? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. Uh, Probably not. But if you had been reading all of Mark's biography of Jesus, they might have popped out at you because for almost 15 entire chapters, Mark had not named names. So there there were a bunch of people who followed Jesus. He had a whole bunch of disciples. There were these women who followed him and believed in him. But when, when he gets to the point when Jesus is on the cross, he starts naming names of these women. And then in the next paragraph, when Jesus is laid in the tomb, he starts naming the names of these women. And then, In the third consecutive paragraph, as we're reading here, he names the names of these women. And I want to ask you, why why would he do that? Well, maybe Mark wanted you to know that this wasn't just a a story and a tale that happened long, long ago where some people saw something at some time in some place. Maybe he was trying to give you the names of, of witnesses if you didn't believe it. See, the book of Mark wasn't written like, 500 years after Jesus died. It was written about 25 to 30 years after it happened. You know, for us, what would that be? Like something that happened maybe in like 1990. And if I said back in 1990, this crazy thing happened and you know who saw it? Joe Thompson and Bob Simmons. And and I'm naming the names so that if you want to go talk to them, you can find out this isn't just some made up story. They were there. Mark is giving us witnesses. Why would he give us the names of the names of the people who saw it well, unless Easter actually happened. And it's not just that, but, but do, do you know something unique about the names of these women? All three of them are 
women. <laughs> I went to school for a long time to figure that out. Okay? Right. Now, do you know why that was shocking? Back in the first century, women were laughed at as witnesses. Uh, unlike today, women didn't get a good education. They were considered too emotional, too frantic. You, you couldn't believe a woman. In fact, in, in Jewish court, women were not allowed to testify because who in the world would believe the testimony of a woman? You know, so if Mark is just making up this story, if he just wants to write a book that's going to sell a lot of copies and get people to follow his religion, why, why in the world would he base the biggest day of all on the testimony of a group of women? Why would he risk his credibility, the number of copies he could sell, unless, unless maybe it actually happened? <laughs> and did you notice what the women did? They bought spices. Do you know why they bought spices? Because they thought Jesus was, was dead, just like everyone else. They didn't show up with egg bake and donuts to celebrate Jesus when he burst out of the tomb. They thought he was dead and he was going to stay dead. In fact, did you know that every demographic in that culture did not believe in a resurrection from the dead? Like the, the Greek people, uh, maybe you heard that from our lesson from 1 Corinthians 15, they, they thought this was ridiculous. The, the Greek philosophy of the time was that your body was like this corrupt, rotting shell and your pure immortal soul needed to escape it through death. So the Greeks would have said a resurrection. That's, that's vile. That, that the point is to escape the body, not to go back to it. In fact, even the Jews believed in a resurrection, but not until the end of the world, the end of time. To tell a bunch of Jewish people, yeah, your Savior is going to come and he's going to die. They would say, your Savior is not going to die. He's going to reign as the king. He's going to rise from the dead. They'd say, no, that's not going to happen until the end of the world. So here's my question for you. Why? Why would Mark make up this story? Like if you're skeptical about the Bible, I just want to engage your brain for a second. Give me the reason why this would be the story. It's a brilliant book. Mark's not crazy. So if he wants to get rich, famous, powerful, if he wants to tap into this you know, desire people have to believe something to get people to follow him, why would he make up a story about a bunch of women who could be interviewed who didn't believe it was actually going to happen and his demographic of marketing would be no one because no one believed it. Unless maybe it actually happened. You see what I'm trying to tell you? Uh, some people think that, you know, Christianity is just something you believe. You're, you're raised with it. It's just blind faith. You got to shut off your intellect and not think. You know, there are people who use their brains and then there's people who are religious. And this little story is just blowing that out of the water. It's saying, no, if you, if you really care about spiritual things, if you really want, want to know something that's true, you can come with your questions and you can fully engage your brain and find answers. If it's true that, that you're not avoiding Christianity just because you want to live life like you want it, which would be a really big problem, but you have some intellectual hang-up, Mark is opening the door that we can investigate if we're curious enough. And so I hope, for, for those of you who are here today who aren't Christians, and I know there's lots of you, and those of you who don't normally show up in, in a Christian church, and I know there's lots of you, I want you to know that you can seek answers today and you can find them in the Bible. And if I could be just totally blunt with you for a second, forgive me if this is too much, if we just met, but, th but there are two reasons why I really, really, really want you to take the next step. Reason number one, because you are not as good as you think. And reason number two, God is infinitely better than you thought. You know, so often in life, we, we compare ourselves to other people and, and we know some idiot who's just like a head case on the soccer field, at least I'm not that guy. And there's that woman at work, you know, who's always gossiping and I'm not perfect but at least I'm not like her and, uh, you know, there's people in our family who are just drunks and deadbeats and they never did anything with their life. We, we often compare ourselves to that and, and we feel like we don't need saving. But, but God sees things a different way. God sees every moment of, of anger and every jealous thought and self-seeking attitudes and those times we don't control our tongues and we just want to win in our, like, that's, that's bad to God. That's really bad to God. And he has to judge it. He, he couldn't just leave the people who are victimized by our anger and selfishness just to suffer with no justice. And so he has to call us into account. And he's going to call me into account and you to account. And how will you deal with your own badness? Unless there is a God who's filled with goodness. 
See, I don't want you to take this next step just to be religious or to join the church or make church this full every single Sunday. I, I want you because Jesus is ridiculous. <laughs> because Jesus will offer you something better than karma, but better than scales at the judgment day. Jesus will offer you like forgiveness. Like you don't have to fix yourself. He will love you in this moment and, and save you in this very moment and accept you in this very moment. That you don't have to wait until you're a better person to start rejoicing and get amped up because Jesus is alive and he did it for you. And so if this isn't your thing just yet, if you're kind of skeptical about it all, I want to offer you a challenge today. If you're taking notes in your program, I want you to write this down. If you're a skeptic, I want you to sign up for 90 days with Jesus. So on that communication card in, in your program, if you would just write somewhere on that card, 90 days, uh, Pastor Michael has agreed to read through all four biographies of Jesus and answer as many of your questions as he can. Uh, there's this great app that has uh, a 90 day journey through the four Gospels. It has a chance to read maybe just five or ten minutes a day. It's not a huge commitment and a place to just ask questions that Pastor Michael will see and he'll try his best to answer and deal with your skepticism and your doubts. And I pray, I pray, I pray that you take that step because you have the chance to be as happy as a pastor on Easter. Because Easter is for skeptics. But not just for skeptics. Uh, Easter is also for sinners. Like the woman who called me a few years ago. Uh, I was at a soccer field for one of my kids' tournaments and uh, I remember I had a Subway sandwich in my hand and a woman from my church handed me her cell phone. And I said, Hello? Hello? And it was a woman I never met before. I'm not even sure if she told me her name, but she was bawling because of something she did. Uh, she had an abortion. She, she got connected to this guy. You know, they, they hooked up. He was not a good guy. She was scared. She terminated the pregnancy and she, she just couldn't get past that decision. She felt so bad and so guilty about what she had done, about the guy that she had slept with. And, and she's telling me this story and she, she just feels like such a bad person, like such a sinner. And, and then I find out that it didn't happen last week, that the abortion happened 20 years before the phone call. It was this, this massive weight on her conscience that she couldn't get past. And some of you have felt that, right? Uh, some of you have thought that when you walk into a church, you're, you're smelling for smoke because you think the place is going to burn down. And you know Christian people and you know church people and, and you know the standards of what the church says and you're, you're just not even there. And so you, you wonder, can I, can I even be part of this? Maybe you have this low-level anxiety when you're talking to people. Like if they really knew the things that I had done, the words that I had said, how much I drank, the way I've snapped at my kids, and what, what spewed out of my mouth with my ex, like if there was video footage of that, they would, they'd boot me out and they would lock the doors. And so we're singing and people are celebrating, but I don't know, there, there's something in your heart that won't let you get there. Like, if you feel that way, there are two things that I want you to catch in this chapter of the Bible. There, there are two stones, to be exact. Now, here's the first stone. From Mark 16, verse 3, the women asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Uh, do you know how tombs worked in the ancient world? Uh, if you could afford it, if you were part of the 1% wealthy, uh, you would have a tomb like this. You'd buy like this piece of rock and you would hand chisel out a cave inside that would become a tomb. Um, you wouldn't make the door very big because it was hard work. So you just had to sneak through. And in front of the door, so people couldn't rob the grave and take the, the wealthy, you know, jewels and uh, bodies of your loved ones, they would roll this massive stone. There'd be like this little downward slope and picture like a big disc-shaped stone would get pushed down in front Gravity would do its work and it would fall into place. Um, many archaeologists think that those big stones would weigh between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds. You know how much that is? Two to 4,000. Uh, I googled it. The heaviest offensive line in the NFL is the Oakland Raiders last year. Uh, they averaged 335 pounds a man. I think it's 1,634 pounds. Together, they would be lighter than a small gravestone. A 2013 Ford Taurus just taps out at over 4,000 pounds. And, and if you put the Taurus in neutral, you could push it down the slope. But can you imagine a bunch of 
grieving women who haven't eaten, trying to push it back up. And so they asked the right question. They just hadn't thought about it when they bought the spices. How, how are we even going to get to Jesus? They thought the stone was a showstopper. It was a deal breaker. Something was in between them and God. And then they get to the tomb. And do you remember the words of, of the next verse in verse 4? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. It, it turns out what they thought would get in between them and Jesus wasn't even an issue. They didn't have to push it. They didn't have to work at it. They didn't have to call their friends. They didn't have to come up with some incredible invention. It was just, it was just gone. <laughs> and that's the same thing I, I want to tell you. I mean, you think maybe the, the abortion, the, the anger, the words, the choices, you think the, the pornography, the jail time, the drinking, the drugs, you think this is going to be some huge thing that's going to get in between you and Jesus, but you actually open the pages of the Bible, you know what you find out? It's a non-issue. <laughs> what you thought was this huge deal that God could never forgive, Jesus is like, what? Oh, yeah, well, like, what, what do you think I died for? <laughs> and he rolls it away by himself so that you don't have to take care of it. But wait, wait, wait. Like, you might be thinking, you know, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. You, you weren't there. Like, you don't know how many times I turned back to that, how many times I said I went, I, you know, I made a promise to my wife, to my husband, then I did it again. I apologize to my kids and then the next time, it, like you don't know, how, you, you wouldn't just say, oh yeah, it's forgiven, it's not a big deal if, if you would have been there. For the sake of argument, uh, let's just assume you're right. Let's assume you are the worst person sitting in this room right now. Like you were just a foul, disgusting, embarrassing, you're, you're the worst one that's ever walked in to these seats in the history of our church. Let's assume that for the sake of argument. Did you catch a little detail about Mark 16 when I read it the first time? When they go into the tomb and there's the angel and there's the big news, he's not here, he's risen. Do you remember those two little words that popped up in those verses? Let me show you one more time. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who is crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter. You know why those people are laughing? Because <laughs> Peter was a screw-up. He had a huge mouth and, and he said, Jesus, even if all these other bozos abandon you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for you. I'm going to be here for you. But you know what actually happened? Jesus, Jesus was suffering and he was dying and, and Peter denied him. Do you know the name Peter in Greek actually means rock? It was Jesus' nickname for the guy. His, his original name was Simon. But Jesus said, I'm going to call you Peter. But the night that, that Jesus was arrested, Peter was not a rock. He was not a two-ton stone. He, he was this little pebble who got pushed aside by a featherweight of a middle school girl who said, hey, you know Jesus. And he denied it. And the Bible says he calls down curses. Like, I swear to God, he's, he's dropping swear words. I don't even know who Jesus is. And just as they're spitting in Jesus' face and they're whipping him and they're leading him out to be tortured and to die, Jesus looks through the crowd and he meets eyes with Peter and Peter falls apart. And he feels like the worst person on the planet. And so on Easter morning, when, when the angel comes with this good news, Jesus is alive, don't miss those two words, and Peter. And what I adore about the Bible is that Jesus has a special place in his heart for screw-ups, for losers and for sinners. For people that if they started coming to church, their buddies at the bar would say, what? <laughs> you? <laughs> they let you in? Say, so, yeah, yeah, Jesus lets people like me in. Do you know the three guys who wrote the bulk of the Bible, what they had in common? They were all murderers. Moses, David, Paul, murderers. Paul was murdering Christians and God let him write half the New Testament. So maybe, 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 if you've done something really bad, <laughs> it really isn't an issue for God. Maybe he could actually just forgive you and maybe he already has. So if that's you, I want you to take a next step today. Uh, grab your pen, you sinners. I want you to write this down. You should talk to a pastor. On that white communication card, there's a little box you can check that you're interested in talking with a pastor. I want you to check that box if you're struggling and I want to, I want to tell you what's going to happen. Uh, this week, Pastor Michael and I are going to follow up. We're going to text you or we're going to email you if you leave us some contact information. We're going to find a time to sit together. You're going to be really nervous. Uh, you're going to show up at the coffee shop or in our office. 
you're going to blurt it out. It's going to be really bad. You think we're going to be disgusted. And here's what we're going to say. Uh, you know God loves you, right? And then we're going to open the Bible to one of like a, a billion possibilities. We're going to read that God actually loves really messed up, sinful people. And we're going to insist that you just leave it there and go in peace. That's what's going to happen. And some of you need that. You need to see how God reacts to you. You need to say it out loud and have someone forgive you instead of be disgusted with you. So if guilt is your problem, if shame, embarrassment, if sin, reach out. We'd love to help. Because Easter isn't just for pastors and skeptics. Easter is for sinners. And finally, Easter is for people who are stuck. Uh, You remember the, the emotions of that morning? If I could turn you back one more time to Mark chapter 16, it says, trembling and bewildered, the women went and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I mean, there's just so emotion. In, in the Greek language that Mark wrote in, the word bewildered is the word ecstasis. You recognize that? This is ecstatic. This was like, this was ecstasy. This was so much emotion that they were just burst. They didn't even know what to do. They just ran around and they couldn't even find the words to say. They were, they were so afraid. They were trembling. What, what does this mean? about life and, and maybe, you know, you'd say, I'm, I'm not there quite, quite yet. I'm a church person, I'm a Christian person, but I don't know if I, I feel like ecstasy, crazy emotion of, about Jesus. Um, if that's you, I'm going to give you just one piece of advice. I want you to think. I just want you to think really, really deeply about what this means. Uh, that's what Joni did. Let me show you a picture of Joni. Uh, Joni Erickson taught him, maybe some of you have heard her story, is a Christian speaker who suffered a terrible accident when she was 17 years old. Uh, she was diving, I think, into a pool and she fractured her neck and she would never be able to walk again. Um, these days, she's 67 years old. She spent 50 years in a wheelchair. And a few years back, Joni was at this big Christian conference, you know, thousands and thousands of people and the speaker up on stage was talking about the power of prayer. And he said, if we're going to change the world, we need to fall on our knees and pray. And I mean that. Fall on your knees right now before God in the whole room. Hundreds, thousands of people, they leave their seats and they fall down on their knees. And what's Joni doing? Sitting there. You think she felt bad? That's what I thought. But, but then I read what she wrote about that moment. She said, in heaven, I will be free to jump up dance, and kick. The first thing I plan to do on resurrected legs is to drop on grateful, glorified knees at the feet of Jesus. What was she thinking about? Resurrected legs. See, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead and when when he comes to end the world, he will raise the dead. And he will not give us back our, our same bodies, just like the, the 18-year-old version of them. Um, the Bible says he will glorify us, which means that there will be no paraplegics and no wheelchairs. There will be no sore muscles after a hard workout or a soccer game. There's going to be no migraines, no depression, no anxiety. There are going to be no miscarriages, no grieving, no death. There will be no suicidal thoughts. All the things that like mess with our days and make us bad, they're temporary. And one day they're going to end because Jesus is alive. Think about that. I mean, think about how good you're going to feel if nothing feels bad. And think about death. <laughs> you're going to die someday. It, it might be today, I don't know, it might be in 50, 60, 75 years. But, but think about this. Jesus came out of the grave so that we would never have to be afraid to die. And think about it. If Jesus is alive, that means he's alive. It, It means he's here and he will be with you always. It means even if you've been divorced, even if things fell apart in your family, even if the relationship didn't work out, even if you feel so alone, you never are because Jesus is alive. So just think deeply about what this day means. It's not some 2,000-year-old news. It changes everything about today. So if you feel stuck spiritually, let me give you one last bit of homework. Uh, If you're spiritually stuck, I think the stuck should stick around. Uh, Next Sunday, we're going to kick off a brand new sermon series here called Evolution of Faith. And the premise of it is that if you really understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can get to this place of inexpressible joy. And we're going to take you on a four-week journey. If you feel stuck, I just want you here next Sunday as we show you 
and think deeply about what the resurrection of Jesus means. Because Easter isn't just for skeptics and sinners and pastors. It's for people who are spiritually stuck. So maybe this day is for all of us. I was originally going to title this sermon, Easter is for all y'all. But my wife kind of gave me that look when I try to be funny. I'm like, let's just call it Easter is for everyone. That sounds a little bit better. I'll leave, it, leave you today with a little bit of news and a little bit of joy as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, some of you who were here last Sunday know that we did something ridiculous. Uh, we talked about this unreasonable thing that, that God would come down from heaven, he would die for bad people, and he would rise from the dead to make us good. And, and I gave you an unreasonable goal. I said, would you give in one week $31,128 to something I'm not going to tell you about? <laughs> and you know what happened? I heard so many stories of people who left church and they said, okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, maybe half. Uh, do you know that you as a church family hit $31,128 by Wednesday at lunch? And now we've had, gifts are still coming in. Someone gave me a $500 check on the way in the church. We're, pro- we're over $41,000 that you have given in less than seven days. And do you know who we're going to give it to? Unreasonable people. See, my wife and I were in Thailand a couple weeks ago and we got to hang out with these missionaries that are part of a group called Friends of China. And I realized how unreasonable it is that they do. Do you know that the biggest groups of them will be gathering on Easter Sunday with maybe 20, 30 people? They've chosen to give up the joy of moments like this with family and friends and Easter brunch to spread the gospel and the good news that Jesus is alive to people who probably never heard it before. And so yesterday, I got to make a, a really exciting phone call. My wife and I got to Skype two of our friends who have served with Friends of China for, for many years, and we took a little video of what happened when we shared the news. Take a look. Hey, Car Family, Pastor Mike here with my wife, Kim. It's been a great week for our church as we think about the Break Your Jar campaign, and we are just about to Skype some good friends of ours who have been serving for years as missionaries in China, and we're hopefully going to blow their mind with your unreasonable gift and the crazy love that you have for Jesus. Here we go. Hey, there he is. How are you? We're just gonna join. Do you guys know that she's not feeling well? Yeah, I, I do. Yes. Kim said that. So, take oh. that medicine. He's doing maybe a little better. That's awesome. Hey, um, I gotta tell you guys something. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, you know how when we were in China with you guys or in Thailand a couple weeks ago, and Aaron, I, I asked you, uh, that awesome retreat for all the missionaries, like how much it cost, and you said I couldn't tell anyone, but you told me. Yeah. So we decided to, like, take an offering at our church. And uh, we were able to raise $12,000 to pay for the whole Friends of China retreat next year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, so we, we're we so uh, happy with the unreasonable things that you guys do. So we wanted to give that to you guys as a gift. And um, I wanted to tell you about it. Oh, that's awesome, guys. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's- the... That's the small part, though. After we raised the twelve thousand, then we raised another twenty-eight thousand. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, we wanted to call you and say that our, this week, uh, in six days, our church uh, decided to put their pennies together and they raised forty thousand dollars for Friends of China. Oh my goodness! Was this was this like an accounting error? <laughs> 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 I was never good at math, but I don't think so. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. So, oh, say, hi, say hi to your friends at the core. Oh, guys. You guys are amazing. We love you all. Thank you. We were following a little bit. We saw your message about the, the woman who poured oil on Jesus' head, and we're like, oh, guys, this is amazing. 
and I, obviously we didn't know a recipient, but it's just really cool what you guys are doing. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> the, the, the people didn't know a recipient either. There was like five of us who knew what was actually going to happen. It's one of the one of the most amazing things about uh, being in the body and about supporting each other is that there's no I don't know how do you say it. It's not a zero sum game. Like everyone wins. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally. just amazing. Like people who give, people who pray, people who serve, people who sacrifice. Everyone feels like they're on the winning side. It's just amazing. Yeah. Amen to that. I, that's that's awesome. Hi, core family, uh, St. Peter family. Uh, we can't believe your generosity. Uh, we can't believe that you chose us. But I want you to know this gift goes a long way, and we just uh, we're forever grateful for what you guys did. Uh, it's amazing, and I. I'm so thankful that that uh, God works in the ways that He does. I mean, you guys feel blessed for being able to give. We feel blessed for being able to receive. Praise the Lord for this. Ah, oh, praise the Lord. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Let's pray. Oh, dear Jesus, <laughs> we're praying to you because you're not dead anymore. Uh, you came back and it changes everything. Uh, thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you for the chance to just hear one more time the great news uh, that we haven't fallen away too far, that you've been pursuing us every day of our life. Jesus, you've been reaching out with risen hands that we could find peace and joy and happiness and a great, meaningful life in you. I pray for everyone who's here today, God. I don't, I don't even know everyone's names, family members and friends and guests, uh, but I pray that you would keep pursuing them until you are their greatest treasure and joy it's the only place that we can guarantee to find happiness because you never change and you always forgive us. So please bless us today. We pray in your beautiful name, Jesus, because you died for our sins and you were raised to life. And all God's people said, amen.